system they were going into, the hierarchies of those systems, and what the expectations are. So moving on from those, uh, the next section was just the nuts and bolts of the sorts of things that employers are looking for. And just to very quickly go through these, in addition to the domain knowledge, non-academic employers were looking for networking ability and professional connections. They wanted to see both your ability to develop those networks and your ability to use them. They also, and this is a bit of a no-brainer, they want to know that you actually had the ability to do your research on the job you were applying for. Um, and surprisingly, not everybody seems to do that. And I'll have a quote a little bit later about that. And she also found that they emphasized that being in non-academic environments isn't just or isn't always about the money. It's also about the value beyond fiscal value that you pull out of that. And then the most interesting to me category was the intangibles, the things that non-academic employers look for that aren't easy to quantify and aren't necessarily easy to put down on paper. But they have an outweighed um, importance in terms of what people recruit for. And these include things like your attitude, your maturity, your passion for the work you do. Um, the sort of fulfillment you'll get out of that job, your ability to work as part of a team, um, your ability to actually contribute to the culture of a non-academic organization. Um, and at the bottom there, something that's really important is they look for communication skills and translation. And I highlight that because in so many STEM PhD programs, communication is not only not emphasized, but it's actually discouraged. Um, the number of stories I have of PhD students in a STEM program who have wanted to expand their communication skills and they've been told by their advisor they are not allowed to spend time out of the lab to do that because the lab work is important. Contrary to that though, and this is where you're going to see later we get to value erosion, non-academic employers actively look for those skills. So you begin to pull these together. And really briefly, I want to go through those three areas of alignment and disconnects and erosion. So value alignment, there was actually quite a bit of alignment here, especially if you're looking at understanding, developing skills, especially interdisciplinary skills and impact. Um, you could see that if you trained as a PhD student with an eye to going, to, in going into academia, you had skills there or values that you could translate into the non-academic arena. But things get more interesting when you get to value disconnects. And I just want to go through these four bullet points because to me, they're important. Uh, the first one, a student's intellectual lineage matters to a non-academic employer, but it's only a partial factor. And I can't actually, I think it's partial because I can't read it because of the, the video, partial factor in their future employability. In other words, while we tend to focus almost entirely on the intellectual side of things in a PhD program, it's only part of a much bigger package that non-academic employers look for. Secondly, academia may think its responsibility is to produce independent scientists, um, and this is high on our priorities, but that may not serve students well in their future careers depending on where they want to work. In other words, not all non-academic employers put independence of research above everything else. And I think we've got to be cognizant if a lot of our PhD graduates go into non-academic careers, we've got to have, give them that ability, not only to be independent and think independently, but also be team players and deep collaborators. Thirdly, leadership and community development really matter to future employers, but are qualities and experiences often overlooked in graduate schools. And if we're being honest here, how many PhD STEM graduate programs emphasize the importance of leadership and community development and actually train their students to do that? So this was highlighted as a major values disconnect. And finally, coming back to communication again, communication skills are critical. But then the question, how do students actually demonstrate these skills, especially if you've been in a program where you're told, do the research, publish the papers, communication comes later in your career. The reality is, if you're following a non-academic track, communication skills from the get-go are critically important. And then finally, value erosion. Um, and again, just three key points here that I want to highlight. Um, and these are areas where 
some of the ways we train our STEM PhDs actually make it harder for them to succeed and thrive in a non-academic environment. So number one, continuing to support and continue the STEM PhD shortage narrative actively erodes the value of those degrees. Um, and this is actually pretty hard stuff to hear because this gets back to the idea of the bait and switch, the idea that we're trying to convince people that there is a wonderful academic career there. So they've got to follow a STEM PhD. They've got to invest five plus years of their life, their savings, whatever into this. And then they suddenly discover that that fabulous career in academia doesn't exist at the end of the pipeline. If we continue this narrative, we end up creating disillusioned graduates rather than equipping them, equipping them for the life outside academia. Secondly, aspects of the culture of academia in the US are often demonstrably toxic to graduates. And this gets even harder. This is really hard truth. Demonstrably, the demonstrably toxic to graduate student success. Um, and again, this is not true of all places, all institutions, but how many institutions create an environment which is great if you're going to be a competitive academic, but not great at all if you want to be a well-rounded person following your passions and your vision outside academia. And thirdly, a student's perception of employment options after graduate school may or may not reflect reality. And this is heavily independent on individual advisors and sheer luck. And the problem here is that even though those opportunities exist outside academia, relatively few academic institutions, especially in our one universities, enable their students to have a realistic understanding of both what those opportunities are and how they need to prepare for them. So I just want to wrap up with a, a couple of quotes and some high level recommendations from here. So this is a quote from one of the study informants. When I first worked for a national lab and a defense contractor, the skills that mattered the most were my technical skills. So that's coming straight out of the PhD. But then in the second half of my career, the communication skills I learned, the interpersonal relationship skills I learned, those skills turned out in the end to be the ones that were most significant. So again, just underlining this fact that there are soft skills here that are really important. Another quote, this is from the vice president for research at a multinational company. Is there something else you've done that's, and that's something else you've been equally successful at? It could be anything. It could be some volunteer activity or could just be a hobby that you have. But because of the hobby you've spawned, a little business and you were reasonably successful. Those kinds of things are also very interesting and attractive because it shows that if you have a passion, you'll go after it and make it happen. To me, this is incredibly important because one of the things that we typically tell our students is don't have interest outside the lab, just focus on the research. And yet it's those very interests outside the lab, those non-academic things, which make you an interesting person and an interesting prospective employee. And somehow we've got to work out how to fold those back into PhD programs and include them. And then just a final quote here before I wrap up to, with those final conclusions. And this to me is a really interesting one, again, from one of the informants. Uh, there are some very outstanding resumes which have been recommended by faculty members that we really respect. But when we spoke to the candidate, it was just, you know, the communication didn't go smoothly. One candidate in particular, he wasn't even interested in telling me what his work was about. He was more interested in asking me questions about how much I knew about his work. Um, and this is the arrogance issue. Too often we train our students to be arrogant, to think that they have all the answers. And believe me, that goes down really badly when you're interviewing, actually it goes down badly in academia, but especially outside academia. So what are the big takeaways here? And I just want to highlight these really quickly. These come directly from Elizabeth's dissertation. So she had messages um, to three groups of people. First of all, to PhD students. Know your worth. No matter what anybody tells you, know what you're really worth. Try and get over that imposter syndrome and realize that you're worth more than just the research that you do in the lab. To the people who form academia and the higher education institutions. So this was directly to me as her advisor. We're counting on you and we're in this together. And this was really a call to action to um, institutions to make sure that we give our PhD STEM students the skills they need to thrive wherever they go. And finally, to future employers of STEM PhD students, building a student's confidence and experience 
is never a bad investment. So this idea that we have these fantastic students with these fantastic skills, but we need to nurture and grow them. So this is where we get beyond the pipeline model and we look at how we enable people to be the best they possibly can. So just to wrap this up, I want to put a few of my own conclu concluding thoughts here. So this begins to merge together Elizabeth's findings with my own experiences over the last 30 years or so. The first one is, we need STEM PhDs. Um, it's very clear that in the society we live in, especially with how important science and technology are in the quality of the life that we have, we need more people that are trained in these areas. That's an absolute given. Um, I would also underline this and say being an academic is the most amazing profession that there is. I love it, but only if it suits you and it doesn't suit everybody. And we've got to realize that there are some people that are going to thrive in a non-academic environment. Thirdly, within our STEM PhD programs, soft skills are essential. We ignore them, we denigrate them, we don't train our students in them to their disadvantage, and we've got to somehow redress that. You don't need to stick to your core discipline. This is one of the things that I learned really early on in my career, that I got a PhD in physics, but now I do everything from emerging technologies and social science, to toxicology, to a range of things. It was the training of the PhD that opened doors, not necessarily something that locked me into my own discipline. And it, that is really important to realize as you craft your career. And then the final thing, be more than your PhD. Your PhD is important, but you as a person, the career you will craft, the things that you will achieve go way beyond just those three letters. Um, and then finally, the most important career as a STEM PhD is the one that brings you joy. Don't do something because you feel you have to, do it because you want to and you love it. So that's where I want to wrap up. Apart from one thing, I'm gonna skip over that. So I mentioned Elizabeth couldn't um, give this talk. She couldn't give it because she's working at the moment. So Elizabeth could have been a fantastic academic. She could have been a fantastic senior person in government. In the end, she went into teaching. She is currently a math teacher and STEAM program developer at St. John the Baptist School in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I am incredibly excited about the, her future career and incredibly proud of her because as a STEM PhD, she is doing what she loves and where she knows that she can have an impact. And she's beginning to demonstrate all of those skills that come on top of doing that PhD. And with that, I'm going to close because I must be at my time and open this up to questions. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Let me just you, stop the share. Uh, still there as well? Okay, good. Okay, uh, see, I didn't see any questions in the chat. Glenn, were you able to, uh, to finish that or the... Yeah, um, there were some questions regarding, you know, looking at, I gathered salary, you know, compensation data for minority serving institutions. And um, if you recall, the, the last slide I put up uh, was looking at cost of living at AAU institutions. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't clear to me if there were um, particular, particular institutions folks wanted to see, but um, <clears throat> that's, that would be tough to, to pull together something like that on the spot, um, looking at cost of living. If there's, if there's something, uh, if anybody wants to know about particular institutions, you can either drop me a line. I could pull up some salary figures now if we needed to, but I, I, I'm guessing that's not appropriate. But well, I guess if uh, if maybe later on, if you can um, maybe get that information, we and forward it to me. I can forward it to the um, to the participants as well. I could just if you don't mind, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what that what yeah. that's really looking for though. Um, I mean. Um, are, are folks particularly interested in cost of living issues? With I, I think uh, Dr. Erickson is the one who posed a question. Dr. Erickson, you want to? Uh... That, that would be nice, yeah. <clears throat> Let's 
c'est uh, well um, let's see uh, I have a question from uh, Rafael Luis da Silva uh, to Glenn uh, any hints on applying to faculty positions during this pandemic um, this speaker was <laughs> shared most of my thoughts on on that um, a couple couple follow-up thoughts I, I was was thinking based on extending that idea was um, it's not so much the number of publications that um, that a search committee would look for as much as uh, ever I think we uh, I think we may have lost may have lost Glenn again. Chris, while while Glenn's just coming back, just very specifically on on that point, um, mm -hmm. I, I think the answer is if people are hiring, um, absolutely go after those positions. The the big challenge is that an increasing number of academic institutions have got hiring freezes in place at the moment because mm -hmm. they're not quite certain what the the um, the financial environment is going to be like over the next 12 months. So that, I think, is the bigger concern with people that are just getting to the end of their PhDs at the moment and beginning to look at those those possibilities. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Are there, um, and if, Glenn, is, if we get Glenn back, we'll let him give his thoughts as well. Are there any other uh, questions? Uh, oh, OK, uh, Rafael liked your answer. so. Hey, thank you for filling filling in. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, did, yeah. Did you want to go ahead and provide your thoughts, Lynn? I, well, just to complete the thought that the search committees tend to look for um, uh, lines of research. So you might have five publications on a particular topic, but they mm -hmm. will say, well, that's one topic. And maybe you manage to get four publications out of your dissertation. Well, they are going to count that as one, and um, and what they what they want is to see that you they want to see evidence that you will be perceived as an expert in the field, and that their department or institution will be seen as a leader in that topic. So. Um, when, when a college or university is thinking about bringing in a tenure track faculty member, they want to know that if we bring this person in, we collectively will be known as, uh, as a leader in that topic. So if, there's, if there are already several other institutions who have that subject nailed down and they're they are viewed as the experts on that that's that works to your detriment it's it's not it's not you as an individual it's the institution wanting itself to be seen as uh, a place that is leading uh leading in a field i don't know i see dr maynard nodding your head on that Do you uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's the value proposition that that you bring, um, and it's what you and your research can do for the institution, not necessarily at that time, but also over the next several years. So one of the things I, I tell our junior faculty is that on the tenure track, the university is looking to make an investment in you. They're going through this long process, putting a lot of money in, and they expect when you get tenure that you are going to do wonderful things and pay back that investment multiple fold. So they're looking for potential. They're looking for somebody who is a good bet, who is going to be self-motivated and build something amazing without having to be handheld through that process. And not so much for the sake of building it as much as 
Yep. As building the institution's reputation as a That's place right. where people would want to go for for that kind of work and as you know. Okay. So uh, this yep. is another question. Uh, I think it's a question. Okay, for universities, uh, for universities where much of the undergraduate mentoring burden falls to graduate students, are there any specific uh, approaches to mentoring undergraduate students towards being open to industry positions rather than following the grad school, the grad student towards graduate school, especially if the grad student doesn't have industry experience. I'm not sure if uh, who that was addressed to, but I guess either one of you want to handle that question. I, I can take a first stab at it. Um, mm -hmm. So this really depends both on the institution and on the program that you're in. So many engineering programs are actually, that not only are they open to industry tracks, but they actively encourage their students to consider that and provide opportunities, whether those are research opportunities or research collaboration and problem solving opportunities. Um, I think that the, the trick, part of the trick here is having faculty that not only are able to tell their students what it's like working for industry, ideally they have industry um, experience and connections, but they're able to actually bring in expert um, experts from industry and researchers from industry to work with their students and ideally pair their students up with people in industry to be part of problem solving teams then. And that's the way that students begin to get a sense of what they can truly achieve within a, a non-academic environment. And I, I would say that the, the people that I work with in industry who are um, STEM experts, they usually love what they can achieve there. Um, they, depending on the company, but I, I work with people who are very excited about how they can change the world. And it's not about making money, but it's how they can change the world in a non-academic environment. See, okay. So uh, um, I guess, uh, well, yeah, we're, uh, we're probably over time for the panel. Uh, so uh, Dr. Uh, Bixby, do you want to, uh, I don't know if I was supposed to hand over to you or Evelyn for the, Thank, thank, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Drs. Colby and Dr. Maynard for uh, participating. A lot of valuable information uh, for those, uh, for both academia and industry. If you have any questions, again, you can uh, enter them in the chat. But uh, I guess I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Bixby to uh, introduce the next uh, presenter. Okay, sure. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know I was the next. Um, that's fine. Um, yeah, we have one bonus presentation that was added uh, just at the end of our planning here. Uh, but we're going to welcome uh, Dr. Donathan Brown just to speak briefly about some opportunities at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, and um, I'll welcome him to go ahead and jump on and share his screen as well. Alrighty, thank you so very much for the introduction here. And let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, let's see, host disabled participant screen sharing. So it's not allowing me to share my you, screen. Hey, I gotcha. Ah. Um, is still sharing his screen? I don't know. Um, try, try now, you should have access. Alrighty, let's give it a shot. Okay. Alrighty, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Man, fantastic. Great. Well, thank you. So I'm Donathan Brown, uh, the Assistant Provost and Assistant Vice President at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And at RIT, we are really committed to materializing the idea of faculty diversity. As we all know, it's a term that you hear thrown around ever so often throughout higher ed, and we've heard it for quite some time to say the least. Uh, but at RIT, we do things a little differently. We offer programs for exploration and opportunity, as well as faculty positions as well. 
One of the fascinating aspects uh, about the Rochester Institute of Technology is that we have a dedicated office uh, who works alongside our search committees to ensure that our searches are diverse, inclusive, and excellent uh, throughout all of our uh, levers within our institutions. And so we're very, very privileged to have such an office and have those efforts as well. Part of my job is about 50% externally facing. That is, oftentimes I'm on the road. I was at North Carolina A&T uh, last semester speaking uh, to, to graduate students about fellowship and career opportunities at RIT. And our approach is that we would love to meet prospective faculty members where they are on college campuses. Now, in light of COVID-19, that's not necessarily uh, the smartest thing to do, to say the least. Uh, but, but nonetheless, our efforts have been engaging individuals where they are on college campuses, particularly in programs that RIT has a propensity to hire uh, thoroughly. And, and so on that note, let me at least talk about a few things here. If you're not familiar with Rochester Institute of Technology or upstate New York, don't worry about it. Uh, in the next two minutes, I'll cover that. Uh, as you can see on the screen here, there are a few fast facts about us, uh, and I'll highlight two of those things. Um, one is our student population, 19,000 plus students, uh, but on our Rochester campus in Rochester, New York, we're about 13, 14,000. So you may be wondering where the additional numbers come from, but if you direct your attention to the five global campuses, that's where we really thrive. So in addition to our campuses in, in Rochester, New York, we have campuses in uh, Dubai, Zagreb, Dubrovnik, China, and Pristina, uh, Kosovo, uh, that really allow our opportunities to engage in global learning, but it also provides opportunity for our faculty uh, to teach globally as well. And so many of our faculty uh, travel to our sister campuses around the world and take students with them in an opportunity to engage in a global classroom. And so when we think about opportunities uh, at RIT, this is one of the most fascinating ones I thoroughly enjoy. Oftentimes when I say Rochester, New York or Rochester in general, the eyebrows go as high as the ceiling allows, uh, particularly uh, predicated upon the country or the, the part of the country in which I'm speaking. Here are a few fast facts uh, about where we are. Uh, within the great state of New York, as you can see, we're very close to Buffalo and Niagara Falls, which is always a great thing. Uh, and just some regional information to help you as well. I think some of the previous conversations pertaining to cost of living are certainly uh, applicable here. You notice our housing prices are about 46% lower than the national average. So again, one of those great recruitment tools we can talk about is that there is an opportunity to both live and enjoy Rochester without absorbing a high cost of living, okay? So one of the things that we do differently at RIT is provide this unique program, the Future Faculty Career Exploration Program. And now within its 17th year, this provides uh, individuals an opportunity to get a, a very strong behind the scenes glimpse into life as a faculty member at RIT. And so for us, this three day, three and a half day program allows participants to speak to department chairs and deans, present their research, talk to administrators, staff and students, and really get a better understanding as to who we are as an institution. What are the duties, responsibilities and requirements for tenure and promotion? And what is it about the Rochester community in itself that draws so many people here from different parts of the world? And so, as I mentioned, we're now in our 17th year of the program, and we have had stellar success bringing in candidates and applicants from all over uh, the United States and really getting a better understanding of who we are as an institution. One of the things, in addition to that, is we provide what we call our scholars network. And we essentially uh, match discipline-specific faculty and fellowship opportunities with your expertise in mind. So for example, let's say that you are completing your degree in engineering. You sign up for our scholars network and as soon as we have any position, faculty or fellowship position within engineering, we will send that information to you electronically and allow you to follow up with us. 
The goal here is to make multiple points of contact between you, prospective faculty, and us as an institution. Whether it's my office, the search committees, or otherwise, we want to coordinate those efforts in a meaningful manner. And so oftentimes throughout the faculty search, sometimes uh, there are questions that may come up even prior to applying. And our office is here to gauge and guide that as well. And so as we think about the whole world of faculty diversity nowadays, we think about some of the programs and we think about the people and players, um, RIT continues to do excellent work in this area. And I would really encourage you to sign up for the Scholars Network uh, if you'd like to receive more information about our faculty and fellowship opportunities. Um, as we continue to move forward, we're very poised uh, to continue our pursuit of recruiting and retaining an excellent and diverse faculty. It's been within our strategic planning and model for quite some time. Uh, and RIT has been a, a great beneficiary of many great minds that have come through our campus, um, most notably uh, through our future faculty program. Even if you're questioning whether or not life as a faculty member may or may not be for you, we highly recommend applying to the program because it really is designed to answer all of your questions. Some of the things that you might find as silly questions, there's no such thing. We really want to truly give you a behind the scenes glimpse as to how the clock ticks on our campus. And finally, one of the things that we do quite well is really utilize social media to our advantage to post and talk about our positions throughout campus. We know that very few individuals, particularly when we talk about prospective faculty members from diverse backgrounds, very few, and I, I think the percentage is less than 3%, according to our internal data, uh, receive their job information, receive our job information from outlets like the Chronicle. So we know that for search committees to post a position in the Chronicle is not an inclusive search. It, it, in my opinion, it's barely a search. You're, you're scratching the surface of it. And so for us, we understand where many of you are, and that oftentimes are within social media platforms. And so as we've continued to develop our faculty recruiting approach uh, and really making meaningful connections to people, offices, and departments across the country, uh, the one feedback loop that we hear over and over again is that, one, no one checks or reads their emails. I'm aware of that. Uh, and two, it's a lot easier if you connect with us on social media. And so we've been doing that and we've been doing it well. Uh, and in fact, some of our campus visits that we've orchestrated in the fall have materialized from conversations initiated on social media. And so whether we come back to North Carolina A&T or any other institution to talk about our programs in particular, I wanted to at least avail you to the opportunities at RIT and to let you know that they are program and people who are surely dedicated to your success and are here as a mentor to help guide you through the process that you learned about today. Um, so with that, I'll simply yield back the balance of my time and thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much to Dr. Brown. And um, I, I mean, really that, that is gonna bring us to the close of our uh, event. Before you go, um, it's possible Dr. Gloucester will jump back on in a minute to have some closing words, but, uh, and if, if he shows up, he, he's welcome to, to jump in as well. But I want to share one thing that's important to everybody. I'm gonna paste into the um, chat box, and I will also be sending you by email um, a link to a evaluation survey for today's event. So it's very simple. Um, it's a very simple, I'm gonna type in right now so you can see it. It's a very simple link you can type in or copy and you'll also receive an email to this effect if you don't have the chance to do it right now. But if you simply go to bit.ly slash capital PFMF 2020, um, that'll take you to the evaluation survey and it'll allow you to provide your feedback and your comments on all the different sessions as well as the event as a whole. So we do really ask that all participants please um, you know, take, take a few minutes to just fill out that survey and give us some, some information. And I can also say on my part, um, we have been recording the entire session, uh, the entire event. We will provide, um, you know, information about the recordings as well as the slides 
from all um, all presenters who were who will give us their permission to do so. And so you can also look out for communication from us on that front. Um, uh, Dr. Gloucester, if you are there, did, did you have any closing words you wanted to share? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'd just like to thank each and every presenter. This was a wonderful symposium, one of the best that we've had in our uh, existence of the grant. Um, we hope to continue to sustain, sustain the, uh, the, the program, preparing future faculty even after the grant is gone here at North Carolina a and um, and and I just I just want to say thank you, one thank you all. I think everybody was wonderful. Um, I'd like to also thank the students because um, without you, none of us would be here. And um, and I'm really 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 glad to see that there was such a large interest in people attending our symposium today. Um, in fact, I saw some other emails where there was people who were sort of waiting to get in. So, so that lends itself to the quality of the presentations and the topics that the presenters presented today. And, and so um, I'm just elated. I, my heart is full today to see that we, we could pull off such an event. And, and since there is considerable interest, we may put something together in the near future as well. So once again, thank everybody. I'd like to thank all of the members, all the moderators, um, all of the PFMF uh, co-PIs and, and, and people who are on the grant who helped us uh, put together the, the, the program for today, all of the many hours of work. Um, even there, there's somebody in the graduate office, call it Thompson, who's not even a part of the grant who actually helped us as well. Um, so, so I'd just like to thank everybody and uh, wish everybody uh, safe, safety, stay safe, stay safe, stay safe. And I'm saying that because today I personally receive notifications of at least two people who are no longer with us today, right? And so, um, so take care of yourself, take care of your family, um, and we'll see you again. So thanks.